ultimate combat vehicle has three requirements. Mobility. These chariots had to be able to turn on a dime. Force. It was meant to ride directly into the infantry to attack. And protection. For the first time, it incorporated sloping armor. It's almost like hand-to-hand -hand combat with tanks. You've got to imagine a type of machine that nobody had ever seen. Never seen anything like this. Battlefield Mobility on Ground War. Funding for Ground War was provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of science and technology and to portray the lives of men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. A state-of-the-art tank, armed, steel-clad, and on the move. The pinnacle of mobility of a 4,000-year race to bring speed, protection, and firepower to the battlefield. The quest for mobility has produced many shockwaves, from the ancient chariot, to heavily armed cavalry, to the mighty battle tank. Each step forward has caused advantage to shift and armies to adapt. This is the age of the night. He is virtually invincible. Always, it has been the hunt for the perfect formula of armor, agility, and weapons. The results have been creative and intimidating. Nothing you shoot at them will stop them, and in your mind, it's you they're coming for. And when they come, they come with force. It's the Holocaust on the tank battlefield. The ultimate goal the creation of the perfect armed fighting machine. In ground warfare, mobile units are at the heart of the fighting force. What they bring to the battlefield is the ability to project power over distance and cover ground faster than infantry. Today, the American Abrams M1A2 tank reigns supreme. It is one of the largest, most complex ground war machines ever built. Crushing firepower and formidable armor put it at the apex of tank evolution. There are three primary factors that influence tank design. They are how big is the gun, how well protected are they, and how mobile are they? The way these questions are answered depends on the goal of the designer. The Abrams big gun and thick armor come at a price to its speed and maneuverability. These trade-offs, so integral to the decision-making process today, have been influencing weapons builders for millennia, all the way back to the age of the chariot. In 1457 BC, Megiddo in the Middle East. Two great armies clashed in one of history's earliest recorded chariot battles. Egyptian mobile forces led by Pharaoh Thutmose III attacked a coalition of Canaanite rebels. With speed and ferocity, they won the battle and captured close to 1,000 enemy chariots. The Egyptian chariots were cutting edge for their time. An improvement on earlier designs from other civilizations, they exhibited an effective blend of features. A horse for propulsion, six spoked wheels for strength and speed, and a bow for firepower. Earlier pre-Egyptian chariots had been heavier and more cumbersome, like the Sumerian battle wagon with four solid disc wheels. 
but the Egyptian archers wanted a more nimble fighting machine, a stable but maneuverable platform from which they could aim and shoot. The Egyptian chariot was a fighting vehicle, and as in all fighting vehicles, you want to make them ride smoothly so you have accuracy when firing your missiles. One of the ways the Egyptians achieved a smooth riding firing platform was through the design and construction of the wheels. These included eventually six spokes, rims wrapped in shrunken hide, which formed a, a tire, as well the uh, fighting deck that the warrior and the driver stood on had a, a springy feel that absorbed a lot of the shock. Many of the Egyptian design features can still be seen on today's chariots, or at least their modern day racing equivalents. These harness racing carts, known as sulkies, are built for speed and mobility. Though it looks simple, the sulky is expertly designed. Every detail of the cart is carefully constructed to maximize speed around the racetrack. It weighs as little as 58 pounds, and its frame tube is elliptically shaped, like an airplane wing, to minimize drag. Low weight is essential for speed, and remarkably, the Egyptian chariot was not much heavier than the modern sulky. It weighed about 80 pounds. The Egyptians sacrificed armor to keep the weight down, but that meant the two-man crew, driver and archer, were left unprotected. That's not because they didn't want to protect the individual inside. It's because they felt they didn't need to because any chariot was supposed to fight away from the army. They were supposed to be able to pour archery fire on somewhere from a distance. That way they could be effective, but stay out of harm's way. The Egyptians fine-tuned their vehicle to meet the desired specs. They set the axle at the very rear of the platform, maximizing the chariot's ability to quickly change direction during battle. These chariots had to be able to turn on a dime, stop on a dime, where other chariots are turning, spinning, and wheeling. But the rapid changes in direction increased the likelihood of a flip. To reduce that risk, Egyptian engineers widened the wheelbase. With almost six feet between the two wheels, the chariot could take tight turns and still remain upright. The design worked well for the Egyptians, it gave them an effective weapon for the style of fighting they preferred and the terrain on which they fought. But not all armies opted for fast and maneuverable. As battle tactics evolved, other commanders found new uses for chariots in war. This titanic machine rolled across the Middle East in the 7th century BC. It belonged to the Assyrians and carried four heavily armed and armored warriors. It was built to plow through light infantry. It was meant to ride directly into the infantry force, to make the driver, to make the um, riders all part of a military unit to attack. The chariot proved its worth for thousands of years, but it did have limitations. It failed on rough or swampy ground, and it was expensive to build and maintain. By Roman times, it had been relegated to ceremonial use and racing. Ironically, the chariot was ultimately usurped by one of its own key components. What kills off the chariot is the horse. Now that seems very strange, but horseback riding will eventually mean that the chariot is no longer needed on the battlefield. Selective breeding turned the lightweight draft animal into a powerful beast that could carry a man into battle. Saddles soon followed, but it would take hundreds of years before another innovation in China would transform the horse into a true weapon of war. It was the solid stirrup, and it fused horse and rider into a single fighting unit. 
Over the next centuries, it slowly made its way across Asia to the battlefields of Europe. There, it turned heavily armed cavalrymen into dominant medieval fighters. Fourteen twenty nine, Pate, in northern France. A crucial battle in the vicious One Hundred Years' War between the English and the French. At Pate, the English infantry was unprepared for an attack of fifteen hundred heavily armed French horsemen. The cavalry swept through the English lines. It was a swift and total defeat. The foot soldiers were overwhelmed by the riders and their steeds. This is the age of the knight. The man who rides on his horse, who is armored, who carries a lance and uses cavalry tactics, he is virtually invincible. Invincible in large part because of the leverage and balance his iron stirrups gave him in the saddle. A simple contest demonstrates the advantage. Two horsemen, one equipped with stirrups and one without, prepare to engage in a duel. The fighter in green uses his stirrups to generate force as he strikes. The horseman in brown has less leverage. His blows are weaker and he is easily thrown. Between the forged metal stirrup, the powerful horse, and the heavy armor, the mounted warrior cast an imposing shadow. The medieval heavy cavalrymen were battle systems unto themselves. They dominated European conflicts for 500 years. Tactically, these horse-borne warriors were often deployed like battering rams, bearing down on their enemies in a single line sweeping men aside with the sheer force of their charge. Knights were the elite of the heavy cavalry. Their status and position were superior to that of regular soldiers. But knights had to buy their own armor and horses. So in effect, they became mercenaries for kings and dukes who paid them with gifts of land. The knights fought for their nobles at home and abroad. They had a distinct culture and a powerful influence on medieval conflict. By the middle of the 12th century, they were found across Western Europe. One of the knight's train methods, and also an exciting sport in medieval society, was the joust. Once again, it was the stirrup that provided the stability and balance. He could carry a bigger equipment. The lance suddenly went from a stick to almost a tree that he could carry. And this was knocking people out of the way. Predictably, bigger weapons triggered better defense. By the 16th century, every warrior who could afford it was encased in heavy plate armor. Even the horses were protected. But plate metal is heavy, so just like the Assyrians with their chariots, knights sacrificed some mobility in favor of protection and momentum. Between the stirrup, the armor, and the lance, an approaching knight was difficult to deflect. A rider can now put the lance under his arm and carry the impetus of the horse and the rider into a blow into an opponent. Maximizing the potential of horse, rider, and weapons, the knight was the heavy fighting vehicle of the Middle Ages. The man on his horse, a knight, is absolutely frightening. He was a mobile tank. And an icon of cavalry armies that would persist for centuries as the apex of mobility in battle. 
until the arrival of next great advance. 1914, World War I, Northwestern Europe. Two armies stagnated across a line of defensive trenches more than 500 miles long. Out of this massive deadlock, a revolutionary new weapon emerged, one that would change warfare forever. There in the trenches, with both sides trading fire and gaining little advantage, the need was obvious. The question is, what kind of machine will enable you to break that trench stalemate? The first solution came from Winston Churchill, Britain's first Lord of the Admiralty and a lover of new technology. Churchill had been captivated by armored cars, which combined mobility and protection. Fast motor cars, and it was getting loads of publicity, all things Churchill lived for. So he backed the production of bigger and better armored cars. The vehicles were successful against German cavalry in the early months of the war when the fighting was mobile. But they struggled in the mud and craters of the Western Front. Something with more traction was needed. Trench stalemate brings about one of those light bulb moments in history. The light bulb? A piece of American farm equipment that used tracks instead of wheels. What worked on the farm could work on the front. So Britain applied the concept to the world's first tank, Little Willie. The earliest prototype was a primitive metal box riding on imported American tracks. The British hoped the tracks would keep Little Willie from getting bogged down in the mud. But early tests were disappointing. Little Willie's nose stuck out in front, so if it fell into a trench, it couldn't climb out. The tank went back to the drawing board. And so, Big Willie was created with a revolutionary new design. Its tracks went beyond the front of the body and were high enough to grip and climb over most obstacles it encountered. The secret of this design is the way the tracks wrap all the way around the body of the tank. The reason for this is that the tanks are expected to cross wide trenches, nine feet wide in some places, and rough ground. Big Willie proved it was up to the task. Its crushing power was clear, and it was quickly sent to the front. The British thought they had an answer to the German trenches. In September 1916, Britain's revolutionary war machine was unleashed on an unsuspecting enemy. You've got to imagine a type of machine that nobody had ever seen before. I don't just mean the Germans, I mean most of the British soldiers on the Somme had never seen anything like this. And they start moving in the pre-dawn mist when you could hardly see your hand in front of your face. It appears to slither along the ground. It's quite bizarre the way it moves. So far as the Germans were concerned, they called these machines the devil, and the cry soon went up along the trenches, the devil is coming. Nothing you shoot at them will stop them, and in your mind, it's you they're coming for. But once the Germans got over their initial shock, they realized Big Willie's bark was worse than its bite. The men inside the tank were vulnerable to counterattack. Well, I'm in, and there's nowhere to put my hands because I'm between the transmission and the engine, and all that's hot, and I'm already feeling claustrophobic. This is the engine, a mass of red-hot moving parts. You can imagine the heat that that generates, and every crew member is only two or three feet away from it. The only way to communicate was with one of these. Of course, the crew can't really see what is going on, and they can't really derive the comfort from looking at each other because all they see is an outline in the dark. Their face is covered by one of these chain mail masks, 
which is some protection against the metal splinters that flake off the side of the tank as soon as it's struck by explosive. The most difficult thing you have to worry about is plunging artillery fire, because artillery fire can kill a World War I tank. It's only moving three miles an hour. It's a big target. It was only when they started to open up derelict tanks and discovered only the feet and legs of burnt crew members remaining because the upper part of the torso had completely been incinerated by the furnace did it dawn on these people that they were part of a, a, a new type of warfare that nobody had ever experienced before. These slow-moving monsters were futuristic in design and shocking to see, but they were not the answer to the Allies' prayers. On the Somme, many got stuck in shell craters or were destroyed by artillery. Only a third even made it to the German lines. Big Willie was designed for one specific goal, to break through German trenches and lead the Allied soldiers forward. But in the end, its novel design was unable to stand up to the rigors of war. It was too slow, had mechanical problems, and was not used as effectively as it could have been. But the tank would eventually come into its own. 20 years later, in World War II, it would establish itself as a critical weapon of war. 1940, Northwestern Europe. Hitler's Panzer tank divisions sliced through Belgium and France. Overpowering Allied defenses, they reached the English Channel in 10 days. Despite the failures of Big Willie, Germany had recognized the tank's potential and built up an impressive tank army. Ironically, one of their sources of inspiration was a British officer. Major J.F.C. Fuller the British Army is visionary when it comes to the use of the tank. After World War I, Fuller had rejected the original concept of tanks leading infantry into battle. He foresaw tank units that could be used in numbers and at high speed. Fuller's vision was radical, and the enemy was paying attention. Fuller, ironically, can't sell the idea in Britain. He can't sell the idea in America, but the Germans are reading him. One German in particular, General Heinz Guderian, the father of German tank warfare. Guderian turned Fuller's ideas into reality. High-speed armored divisions able to win battles on their own. The Panzers were unleashed on Belgium and France with great success. The early models emphasized speed over armor and firepower. They were supported by aircraft and by infantry carriers and artillery that were also on tracks. Importantly, the vehicles could also receive and send messages. There's one thing that you might not think about, but it's absolutely essential. It's the ability of one tank to communicate with another, so it's the radio. In 1940, most Allied tanks had receivers that could only handle incoming signals. But Guderian's tanks were equipped with two-way radios, so commanders could coordinate their forces during battle. Throughout 1940, the German panzer units had great success outmaneuvering and outfighting heavier Allied armor. But then, on the Eastern Front in June 1941, the tables began to turn. The Soviets rolled out a new tank that put the panzer to shame. The Soviet tank had its origins in the 1920s, on the other side of the world. 
One of its primary design elements came from American inventor J. Walter Christie. Christie was a one-time race driver with a passion for speed. He created a futuristic tank that could pierce enemy lines, soar over trenches, and cruise on tracks at over 42 miles per hour. The secret was in Christie's suspension, which was far less rigid than previous designs. They were made to crawl, his to fly. Christie invented a truly innovative system. And the secret of it, ever so simple, large diameter wheels like these, and each wheel on a separate swinging arm pressing against a big spring. The swing arms were shock absorbers, allowing the track to move up and down on rough terrain. Christie offered his tank to the Americans, but they had a different philosophy on tanks and rejected it. So the Mercurial Christie sought out other buyers and sold his suspension to the Russians. They used it to create the legendary T-34. This was the tank that would take on the German panzers in 1941. A young Leningrad engineer, Mikhail Kushkin, was put in charge of the T-34 project in the Ukraine. Kushkin's inspired idea, which exemplified a more general Russian military philosophy, was to design a tank that was basic but reliable, a workhorse on the battlefield. To prove its dependability, he drove two prototypes more than 400 miles to Moscow for his Red Army superiors to inspect. The T-34 won their approval, but Kushkin's design made no concessions to crew comfort, and his vehicles proved hardier than he. Koshkin drove this tank throughout the winter. The conditions were so bad and the distance so great that he developed pneumonia and subsequently died. But his death did little to slow the T-34 down. It quickly went into full production, and on the Eastern Front, its pace and firepower overwhelmed the German panzers. The T-34s also had another critical design feature that gave them an advantage. For the first time, it incorporated sloping armor so that incoming fire can ricochet off the armor. Sloped armor was a groundbreaking concept. The shells ricochet instead of piercing because the effective thickness of the armor gets greater as its slope increases. Earlier tanks were designed like boxes on tracks making enemy shells more likely to penetrate. But sloped armor gives the tank superior defense. It's a simple but effective concept. When an incoming shell meets a perpendicular armor surface, it goes straight through and probably kills the crew. If the armor plate is angled at 30 degrees, the shell might bury itself in the armor, but it doesn't go through. But if a shell strikes armor plate angled at 60 degrees, it bounces off, leaving the tank and crew unharmed. The T-34 is probably the finest example of the use of sloped armor. Here at the front, this very sharp nose. And they achieved this because everything that makes the tank go, and that's the engine, the gearbox, the steering mechanism, it's all at the back. Sloped armor is now a permanent feature on most modern tanks. The nose of the Abrams M1A2 is almost horizontal when viewed from the front. A British Cromwell tank from World War II, on the other hand, has a far more vertical nose. The American Abrams protects its crew but is hardly a defensive weapon. It can also overpower the enemy with its 120 millimeter gun and thermal sight. In Operation Desert Storm, it was able to engage Iraqi tanks from outside the effective range of their weapons. We like fighting from far. We can hit from far. No questions asked. They won't know they got hit till they got hit and they're on fire. <laughs> 